Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us here uh, for this panel discussion on blockchain 3.0 with a focus on consensus algorithms and privacy protection. So first, uh, just in case some of our audience uh, may have missed uh, uh, some of the keynote speeches in the morning, I would like each of our panelists to give a very brief introduction of their current uh, project or research focus. Uh, let's start with uh, Professor Anisimov. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. From my research, I'm a mathematician and also uh, involved in cryptography. So I like zero uh, numbers, I like new schemes. And uh, in general, uh, uh, they, my interests are in coding. For instance, uh, last time I have invented coding trees, which, um, which is very interesting and also could be used in some sort of research. Also, I'm interested in the new mathematical backgrounds for blockchain. I'm looking, for instance, it could be periodic numbers and some other. I told it about periodic numbers, but it's interesting because there are a lot of different topics. Thank you. Uh, is, is that is loud enough? Can everybody hear? All right. Next is uh, Professor McCann. Good evening, everyone. So um, uh, I'm the founder of Algorand, that is a, a new blockchain designed from scratch, from first principles. And um, our aim is uh, try to be uh, simultaneously secure, distributed. In a scale, and uh, a trick to do this is actually to leverage on new technology. Because at the end of the day, uh, we believe that uh, it's technology that is going to set us free. Not only our uh, high ideals, but we, we must be backed by technology to be effective. And so, we would like uh, to use this technology to create you know, a new open blockchain on which a uh, platform in which uh, everybody is welcome and is actually better off to build. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tom Fang, I'm a professor at UC Berkeley and also the founder and CEO of Oasis Labs. At Oasis Labs, we are building a privacy first cloud computing platform on blockchain. Uh, well, this is a new computing paradigm and a new computing platform with a set of unique capabilities and properties. So, first, uh, with a strong privacy protection and it's designed to scale to real-world applications at cloud scale, uh, ranging from gaming to uh, complex applications such as machine learning, and also being able to achieve this without relying on any central party. And with this technology, we hope to enable users to regain control of their data, and also at the same time to be able to benefit from their data. And also we hope to be able to enable innovations so far, that has not been able to, um, due to the silos and uh, and also a lot of valuable data is being locked up. And also on this platform, we hope to enable intelligent smart contracts, essentially um, AI agents that actually can be under user control and towards the long-term vision of democratization of AI. Thank you, Jay. Hi, my name is uh, Jay Kwan. <laughs> I'm the original inventor behind Tendermint, uh, the consensus algorithm, and I'm also the co-founder of Tendermint, the company, uh, and I'm also a co-founder of uh, Cosmos, the Cosmos Network, uh, which uh, I talked about earlier this morning. Uh, and the idea with Cosmos is that we can leverage Tendermint and classical BFT algorithms to bring scaling to the blockchain space by having any parallel independent blockchain that are coordinated through inter-blockchain communication, IBC. Um, just to give some context, uh, I'm a programmer. I've been mostly programming in Silicon Valley for the past decade or more. And uh, uh, what I want to bring is good engineering and, and sound science, computer science into this industry. So uh, I started Tendermint in 2014 uh, because I saw an opportunity to bring classical DFT algorithms into the blockchain space. So we were so, and uh, now 
I'm uh, Alec Ruderin, the uh, founder of Ethereum Project. And right now, I uh, spend a lot of my time working on implementing uh, our, and uh, researching uh, proof of stake and uh, sharding, the uh, kind of consensus and scalability upgrades for the Ethereum network. And um, in addition to that, I have uh, kind of interests in kind of mechanism design, uh, cons consensus algorithms, and kind of how all of these topics at the blockchain space can kind of interoperate and help each other. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Stewart? Hi. Uh, I'm Alice Stewart, a uh, computer scientist at the Ethereum Foundation. My background is in theory and algorithms. Uh, recently, I've been thinking about finance gadgets. Uh, how do we separate Thanks. Uh, blockchain 3.0 is characterized by a dedicated effort in um, solving uh, scalability and privacy protection issues. Um, and proof of stake uh, consensus algorithms in one form or another occupy the center stage of layer one scalability solutions. Uh, in fact, a couple of days ago, in uh, when answering, when replying to a article written by Jeremy Ruby, uh, Vitalik stated that POS is necessary. So uh, the question is, so actually for, for the sake of a proper beginning of our dis uh, discussion on consensus algorithms, I would like to ask Vitalik to explain why that's the case, why it's a necessity, not just something good to have, and specifically uh, how uh, Casper FFG is designed to help with the transition uh, from POW to POS in theory. Um, sure. So um, um, uh, my answer probably have uh, three parts. Where uh, one part basically is um, why I think uh, proof of work is inadequate from a security standpoint, and this has like basically the um, um, the reason why has kind of been there all along, but I feel like it has uh, become much more obvious in 2018 particularly, which is that with proof of work, there's basically two ways that you can do it. You can either have ASIC-friendly proof of work, or you can have ASIC-resistant proof of work. Like, ASIC-friendly proof of work just very easily gets centralized, right? And like, in the case of Bitcoin, like, one company produces almost all of the hardware and its affiliated pools have about, like, very close to 50% of network hash power. Um, and with ASIC resistant proof of work, there is these two flaws where one is that it's, and there was this article from uh, SIA a few months ago that showed that it's actually very hard to make it out where there's ASIC resistant. And even with ETHash, which um, you know, like, it seems to be kind of widely accepted now as the most ASIC resistant algorithm uh, that's been used so far, there has been Bitmain and other companies have started building ASICs for it. But also, even if successful, ASIC resistant proof of stake is vulnerable to attacks from kind of rented GPU farms, right? So from a security point of view, no matter how you do it, proof of work is just hard to make secure. Also, I believe that, you know, in the long run, the cryptocurrency space cannot just rely on kind of speculation. And so the cryptocurrency space has to rely on kind of secure, like, uh, people valuing the coins because they value the coins for their utility. And in that context, if all of these coins have uh, our kind of have this uh, theory of kind of inflationary issuance schedule, then I think it's uh, very easy for them to just go to zero in price, right? Like they basically, you would have to have kind of more and more speculation every year if you want them to retain value. And so I view proof of stake, which can have kind of much lower issuance as, and possibly, I actually think zero issuance if you rely on transaction fees as something that's in the long run much more economically sustainable. And because of things like the ability to kind of penalize specific validators for um, violating the protocol, you have the ability to make attacks on a group of state much more possible, right? You can actually design protocols where even if some particular party gets more than 51%, they can attack the network once, and they can cause the network to break once, but they, um, like after that, they're, they're, once their attack is finished, they lose all of their points and the network Right, so the ability to guard against and recover from attacks, I feel, is much more greater at proof of stake. And um, Casper FFG is, right now, we recently moved from kind of hybrid proof of stake to full proof of stake, and that's our effort at um, 
like basically we're trying to create a pure state algorithm that combines some of the best ideas from both crypto economics and mechanism design and traditional business default tolerance theory into an algorithm that combines as many of the best properties as possible. Okay, thanks. So, it, uh, just Jay, so this morning we introduced a uh, junior keynote speech initiative, Tenement. It's a very popular uh, consensus engine. Uh, I'd like to, you to take this opportunity to uh, briefly explain to us how Tenement actually works, uh, what improvements of how BRT has been made to Tenement, and what are, what are some of its uh, unique features? Okay, thank you. So, um, it's going to be very difficult to explain fully how Tenement works. But we have about three minutes. <laughs> yeah. I think it goes like this. The idea is that um, you know exactly who the signers are. So you can imagine that there are 100 signers for blockchain, for example. Uh, we call them validators. And uh, at every block, uh, the block is considered to have been committed if uh, more than two thirds of the 100 signers sign that block. Um, so everyone, everyone should be participating in signing. You want these validators to be online and available. Um, they're not like Bitcoin miners that you can just plug in and out because we're favoring consistency over availability in a sense. The way it works is um, there are three, uh, it, it goes in a round. Uh, so if it doesn't, if consensus doesn't happen in the first round, then it'll go on to the next round and the next round and so on until a block is found to uh, have been agreed upon. And every round is split into three steps. So like the first step is, um, is proposing the block. Uh, at this step, there's always a designated proposer that everyone agrees on. So uh, if I'm the proposer, I will propose a block and it'll get gossiped. And then the second uh, step, you have uh, your first step of voting. So everyone votes and says, okay, this is a good block. Now, when you have more than two-thirds of votes on this step, then uh, you can go ahead and vote for that again, for that same block again on the third step. And so it's a two-phase commit algorithm with two steps of voting, um, and it requires three uh, steps uh, to, to make a full round. Um, so that's how it works, but you know, the properties that it gives you is that uh, you, get, you get the full properties of the BFP system, so uh, as long as less than one-third are acting maliciously or Byzantine, you're, you're guaranteed to progress and, and make blocks. The, um, and just about the improvements, so until, I'd say, Tenderman, you know, the state of the art in BFT algorithms was this algorithm called PBFT, but PBFT was designed for a file system. Um, it's not very efficient. Uh, it's not really designed in a blockchain public setting. Uh, so one of the things we did was we made it so that uh, you know it's about blocks. So block is a batch of transactions, and you amortize the cost of the consensus uh, over you know many transactions. It makes it much more efficient. Uh, the other is that uh, unlike PPFT, uh, when PPFT uh, has a sticky leader, stick, uh, PPFT has a sticky leader. And when the leader um, fails for whatever reason, then recovery is difficult. It's a complex system, which makes uh, accountability more difficult. So Tenderman is actually a simplification of, of, of TBFT uh, in some sense. Um, another feature is that unlike TBFT, which uh, doesn't specify, what, which requires point-to-point -point connectivity of all the validators, um, Tenderman uh, is more like Bitcoin in that uh, it works gossip. So as long as all the validators are somewhat connected, uh, they can come to consensus. Um, so those are the properties of the algorithm. And then when you look at the implementation, uh, what we did was we, we also created an interface layer called ABCI, um, the Application Blockchain Interface. So Tenement is uh, the engine that comes to consensus and it handles peer-to-peer -peer networking. But through ABCI, you can attach your application to your state machine. Um, so basically, a lot of people last year, for example, have been talking about pluggable consensus, especially like in the, the Hyperledger project. Um, Tendermint through ABCI is pluggable consensus. Okay, thanks. Uh, so Professor Dekali, uh, this um, algorithm is a very exciting new POS. Uh, uh, as you uh, explained in your keynote speech this morning, we talked about these two-phase um, approach. 
Uh, one of the, the, I think the underlying core uh, consensus algorithm is called Bison, Bison and the Gradient Protocol, right? So I try to understand, so the committee, uh, the committee members are, and also known as uh, verifiers, once they're elected, what happens? Uh, do they go through a BFT two-phase voting or something like that? Can you give uh, some more details about how BA works? Okay, I have so many questions uh, in one, uh, so let me do my best. First of all, you are right about this, that Algorand is about Byzantine agreement. Byzantine agreement is the strongest notion in uh, distributed computing that there is. However, it was very, very slow, and it required to know in advance who the players are that try to reach Byzantine agreement. In a permissionless blockchain, this cannot be. So what people have done is to keep the name Byzantine agreement because of that it means a lot of security, and they put an adjective in front of it. Practical Byzantine agreement. On the face of it, practical Byzantine agreement ought to be better than Byzantine agreement, right? Because you have to be whatever Byzantine agreement was, and in practical in addition. Turns out, no. Practical Byzantine agreement means something weaker than Byzantine agreement. So we are after and what we want to do is that we want to base rich consensus, the entire community, on a board. Period. How to do so? We must randomly select actually a bunch of us to actually run the Byzantine agreement and then get to run a super fast version of Byzantine agreement. No adjective in front of it. First of all, this selection of, uh, say, uh, call it a committee, which is a small committee, has to be unpredictable even to me. So each one of us runs a, a secret lottery in which if you win, you know that you are a part of the committee and you can prove to others by exhibiting a winning ticket proving that you are part of the committee that uh, agrees on a board. Okay, so beforehand, that's why it's hard to corrupt committees in Algorand because an adversary does not even know in advance what the committee members are. And each committee member speaks only once. So after he or she has spoken, the adversary has no advantage corrupting him or her. So beforehand, you don't know whom to corrupt, and after the ex post, after you know who should be corrupted, it's too late to corrupt them anymore. Right? So that, I think, is very But I think that consensus is a great way to go. Consensus among everybody, not just as the chosen few, 100 or 200 or 21, as I mean, the I mean, both say, because it's our own defense to be really, truly distributed. And to have this unpredictability until the last minute, until it's too late to go up, is what is going to keep you know, a blockchain secure. Yeah, thank you. Professor, so from this morning's keynote, we know that Oasis Lab is building a uh, brand new framework um, platform uh, to solve scalability and privacy protection issues. Uh, so, can you give us some more details about the, the underlying consensus algorithm, algorithm uh, you are using? Is it a kind of a BFT variant or something? Um, so, first, as, as I mentioned, it's actually uh, one important scalability. Uh, like one important design decision to enable the scalability in OSIS platforms is that we actually decouple uh, these different functions, the consensus storage and compute functions, uh, so that each layer, since we have the consensus storage and compute uh, separate layers, in this way each layer can scale independently and also each layer can improve and evolve independently as well. So the whole platform is much easier to improve and evolve. And given that, actually, um, so one advantage of the platform and their approach is that we actually can change the consensus, uh, right? The, the compute layer and the storage layer are essentially independent of the, the consensus layer. So in this case, it's easy for us to leverage the best consensus mechanism. With that said, so we actually will be using true for the consensus. Dr. Stewart. Yeah, uh, Polkadot is another well-known cross-chain project, and it has some, quite some fans here in China in the tech community. And uh, is Polkadot using 
area that the FDA consensus area. Can you uh, give us some more details about it? What unique features it has? Well, yes, we do use the FDA. So I think we can use the approach now that's possible to do it. So again, it is to do um, to do this to do about uh, ICT degree. Um, we want this bigger, as many people validated as possible to do it, to be more decentralized. And um, this means it might be slow. So ideally, we want to uh, agree on many blocks of things. Like that's the next thing. We have to go one transaction, to agree on one block. That's agree on many blocks. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the way we approach it is a bit of different. Uh, uh, the way we get the approach is a little bit different than Casper, but I think I'm going to get it. So it's, we can get agreement on something 64 blocks ago, as opposed to 10 years now, we have a agreement, we can get agreement on one block. We're not exactly sure how many blocks we're going to be able to agree on. Uh, so we could agree to be able to agree on whatever block two thirds of people agree on. Then we get to try and do a financial gap that actually looks like the full, like 10 years. And that one would be more so than it does. That's not sure the difference is as big as you say it is. Okay. Yes, I will. It's all the same. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have been talking about um, our proof of stake consensus. Uh, because proof of work is widely viewed as a blockchain web technology. Uh, still, there are some people who really love uh, the, beauty, uh, the beauty of its simplicity and the sort of proven track record of security. So this question is for uh, Professor Anisimov. Uh, do you think POW still has a place in 3.0 era? What challenges do you see in POS design and implementation? It's never to be a full definition of blockchain independently of blockchain consensus. What is a blockchain? It's a data structure for storing for information storage and there are some requirements, some requirements for blockchain structure. The data structure could be different blockchain, it could be live, it could be tree, it could be tag, it could be very carefully structure. But it's never to give a formal definition of the blockchain without any proofs of blockchain consensus. But blockchain cannot exist independently. It exists in the environment. It could be P to P network or it could be centralized system or it could be a mixed system. And then this interaction, this interaction should be defined through consensus algorithms. There are different approaches, approaches which depend on, depend on this environment. Therefore, it's necessary to separate notions and then to study them and then to, uh, to bring them together. Okay, thank you, Professor. How many minutes do we have? Okay. How many time do we have? Out there and hope that the people 
use your money for doing whatever you want. That is very hard because people accept your money and do whatever else they want. Okay? Only people want is to maximize it. If you look at the rise of mines and mining pools in Bitcoin, was Mr. or Mrs. Nakamoto wanted to have miners in, uh, in, um, um, in Bitcoin? I don't think so. The guys of miners was an outcome, an undesired outcome of an incentive scheme gone wrong. Because it's, and again, you know, and Wells Fargo in the United States decided to give incentives to their workers to create a new bank account. They created a fake bank account, okay? So to have incentives is not enough. You must have the secure incentives. You must be guaranteed that these incentives will actually do exactly what you want them to do. And for doing this, they have to be a bit more sophisticated than they are going to be. So to make a long story short, in other words, there will be incentives, there will be secure incentives, but they are going to be innovative as incentives, as is innovative our consensus, our consensus protocol, and as it, as, uh, our smart uh, contract protocol. Because if we keep on doing things the good old way, we are going to have bad incentives and concentration of power, which is no place to have concentration of power in a distributed platform like a good blockchain. Thanks. Uh, so now let's look at uh, some of the privacy protection related issues. As Professor Stone, uh, in addition to the examples you gave in, in your speech this afternoon, can you give some other examples of uh, how a smart contracts application, a new smart contract application can be used, can be built by using uh, the OASIS platform? Okay. Yeah, so uh, I think being able to run smart contracts protection and scalability together can really enable lots of new applications that we couldn't build before. Uh, so I, in the morning I give the example in healthcare, how patients uh, can contribute medical data to help uh, improve medical research. Uh, but this is just one of many examples. So another example is in the financial domain. So for example, instead of just having uh, central parties providing credit score services, we can actually use a platform like Oasis to enable decentralized credit score service. So in particular, for example, as what I have learned is that in China, actually, a lot of people don't really have credit history. And so it's very difficult in traditional methods to create credit score for these users. But however, you should still have um, a lot of you know, other types of online behaviors and so on. So there are different uh, data sources that when you put together actually can really help give accurate prediction for credit scoring. But then in this case, there are these different uh, data sources, and also, of course, the data is really sensitive. So if you use uh, technology like what uh, Oasis uh, provides, then essentially we can develop a smart contract, and then inside the smart contract, you can actually have uh, code for training machine learning models, for providing a credit score, uh, and for serving the training machine learning model. And then similar to the example that I mentioned in the morning in the medical domain, uh, here uh, for this credit score uh, smart contract, it can also specify terms of use. Uh, so for example, it can ensure that user's data will only be used for training the credit score machine learning model in the smart contract, it will not be used for anything else. And also can specify how users can get compensated by contributing data to the smart contract. And also in this case, the user, you know, it can be different entities. It can be individual users, it can also be other corporations who actually have uh, users data as well. And so this way then, we can leverage different data sources to then together uh, build a decentralized credit score service. In this case, on one hand, users' uh, uh, privacy is protected, and on the other hand, we essentially leverage uh, parties from different data sources that together can provide a very useful uh, service. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, so Vitalik, uh, ZK Snark was a big hit in last year's DevCon 3. Um, so we want to know uh, what other uh, protect, uh, privacy protection related uh, features already exist in or are being developed for Ethereum? Uh, 
So I know that I believe uh, Kubernetes published some code where they were built a kind of privacy preserving payment system based on uh, the Ethereum that used their ring signatures. Mm -hmm. I know that on top of CD Starks, there was uh, one developer, uh, Barry Whitehead, that released uh, quite a lot of code um, uh, trying to get a few CD Starks and apply them for anonymous voting and privacy preserving tokens and the uh, scale of like, plasma chain security and several other use cases. Um, I, um, I mean, aside from kind of the um, confidential transactions, uh, like ring signatures, um, all the proofs that kind of looked to occur, what kind of cryptography is well thought, and the ZD Snarks, like, there aren't really other kind of big privacy technologies that I, um, that I uh, know about. And, like, I think both of those are actually I mean, there are also other uses, like, probably the other ones are the ones that don't even use cryptography, so, like, you, doing transactions inside of state channels is also a privacy technology, and um, uh, state channels also have progressed a huge amount since last year, right? A counterfactual released their uh, paper um, a few months ago, then, like, state channels. So in the context of blockchain interoperability and governance, 
Do you see any privacy protection related issues or solutions that you want to comment on? Two minutes. Sure. Uh, so, uh, I'd like to agree with what Vitalik and Professor McCauley said. And I think the, the job of Tendermint, for one, is to replicate. And when you have something replicated, it's very hard to keep it secret. So, Tendermint's not going to help you there, it's just going to help you get the consensus. Uh, now, when you look at the Cosmos Hub, the, the role of the Cosmos Hub is to connect to many other blockchains and have secure communication uh, between blockchains. And when you think about the role, uh, you know, how, how this is all going to evolve, uh, I think we want something like the Cosmos Hub to be conservative and not use you know, unproven or advanced photography when it's trying to you know, uh, ensure that the total amount of coins is, is invariant or preserved. Yeah, right. One minute. Yeah, okay, so uh, I think the role of privacy should be delegated to uh, other blockchains that are connected to the Cosmos so Hub, communicating through ICC, you can think of this report, Zcash, zero knowledge proofs, multi party computation, and even secure enclaves, uh, hardware solutions. And they can all just connect to the Cosmos Hub, so you can push it to the edge. Let's do it. Consensus is going to be completely edge. Microphone close to right. I mean, yeah, the main part of the popular consensus is to complete the But we'd like, uh, that's the DNA chain, it is a DNA store. But the, we'd like some of the prior chains to be private and to be commissioned. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole system to know what they're doing, to know what they're doing is correct, not know what actually they're doing. And the, the blank zero knowledge um, proof technology, uh, we can judge that. What they really need to do is to move the rest of the system to what they've done. Is correct. Um, another thing is the map detection. Uh, I don't know the solutions to this at this point. I don't know the um, as it was said um, So we have, or we have one chain and we're going to have both one chain, and that vote is going to be completely over. And that will not be decided to use super balance of it. Because there are, there are issues with Maybe it's just a vote line and um, vote collision. And the question is, can we get any, the kind of privacy properties we need to defeat these on chain? Uh, on chain voting. Can we get receipt free and other things that people don't have to work with each other on chain? I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and then there's that. Okay. Now, I guess we're running out of time, so I, I guess that concludes our today's panel discussion. And thank every one of you for giving us a wonderful discussion. Thank you.